Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. I uh, love where I live. Like, I love where I live. And you know this if you follow me on Instagram, because I post images of my, um, I call it my tree house, right? I live in this, like, apartment, but there's no one attached to me. It's just sort of, I'm above a garage, and below my garage, um, like, that house that's, like, to the side of me, which, it's so good this worked out well, but the neighbors are this incredible family, and they have two kids, Abigail and Oliver. And Abigail is four, and if you've ever been to my home, then you've met Abigail. Abigail is um, incapable of talking. She can only yell. You guys ever met a kid like that? Um, Abigail gets so excited that all of a sudden, when I'm home, she goes, Sarah! Sarah! It is the best thing in the world. In fact, to the point where Abigail, if she is good and eats her dinner, is allowed to come see me, which makes me feel like a celebrity just a little bit. Like, well, if you're good, then you can come and I will, you know, you can come and I will hold court with you, you know, but she loves to come up and her brother Oliver will come, like Oliver will come with her and Oliver, poor thing, he's the quintessential older brother who just like picks up after sweet Abigail as she just is a mess. And I love her because I am her. Like, I see her, and I always say to her parents, like, it gets better, I promise. Because they're like, what is, see, I broke this. What is wrong with our, like, what, why does she just yell? And I'm like, don't worry, it gets better. That was me, right? I was a kid that's parents were, like, concerned when I raised my hand in church. Like, I got something to say. And my parents were like, no, you don't. But that was like, I get, I am concerned that Abigail will become a pastor. But other than that, she is the greatest. So recently, this week, I was in my home and I, I heard the, Sarah! Sarah! And so I came to the, my balcony, which is then I can see into their backyard. You see why this could be a creepy situation, but it's okay. And I looked over the side and she said, can I come see you in tenor? And I said, yes, Abigail, you can come see me in tenor if you ask your dad. So she says to her dad, dad, Sarah said I could go to her house. How many minutes? And he always gives her minutes, but she never knows how many minutes there are. But she's always like, I have five minutes. And she gets to like hang out with you. And so she came and she comes in my house. And the thing that Abigail knows about my house is that I have Alexa, right? I'm even afraid to say her name in here as if like she can like... (laughs) Turn the lights back on, Alexa. Um, So Alexa, uh, if you don't know what that is, right? It is a... uh, it's a, ro- a robot situation. I don't know. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that Amazon is listening. My life's too boring to care, but I think that, you know, it's one of these things you can ask it all kinds of questions, right? And it runs a stereo throughout my house. And so um, oftentimes I'll be listening to music. And uh, when Abigail came over, I was listening to music and Abigail runs up to it and yells at Alexa, Alexa, play my jam, play without me. And first of all, she's like, I don't know what your jam is, like, right? And she's like, no, play without me. And so, a song that I know really well by Halsey, if anyone knows, it's like a kind of a, it's a dance song. Here's what I forgot. There are two versions of this song. One of which has the F word real loud and real early in the song. And so she, um, you know, she starts to dance and her brother all of a sudden goes, no, Alexa, like right when the song and he like just screams when the bad word comes out. And I'm like, this is such a good big brother. (laughs) And it reminded me of when my brother first had his kids and he would not stop listening to the music that had explicit lyrics. He would just turn the volume down. So my niece and nephew would edit themselves when they're singing. So they'd be like, and then I, and he was, I'm like, well, what are the words? He's like, what are you talking about? This goes silent for a minute. I'm like, does it? (laughs) So he would do this. So Abigail doesn't know that that song has a cuss word right in the start of it. What's interesting is I didn't remember that because I'm so familiar with it. Sometimes when we're really familiar with something, 
We think we know it and we actually forget some of the things that are important about it or why it matters. Like maybe the F word's not appropriate for a four-year-old, right? There are things that you start to see differently when you recognize different things. And so we're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about over-familiarity and why there are so many incredible things that we can learn about God that maybe we think we might know. Maybe there's some sayings or, or different things, and so to come and look at them with new eyes. So let us pray, and then we're going to jump into what is meant by the kingdom of heaven. God, as always, we simply ask this. With the words of my mouth, and the meditations of all of our hearts that are gathered here together in this space, be acceptable to you, because God, you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, here is what you guys know about me. I am a, like, there are nerds, and then there are, like, super nerds. And sometimes I think I can cover up my nerddom, but then I find out that for two hours, I've been reading medical journals on how our brains fill in the spaces when we don't know what a word, like, when we are hearing something, our brains can actually decide what the end of the sentence is, and what they are discovering. I need you guys to act that you're like excited about this because then I feel like the two hours was worth it. Um, But what they are discovering is that when you live in a noisy environment, you don't have to hear all parts of conversations because your brains will fill in what you think is going to be the end of the sentence, which is great, right? Except we're often wrong. So let's, let's have a little fun this morning. Okay, ready? Someone is a card... Incorrect. The actual saying is not card shark, but we've just heard it so many times as card shark. Does anyone know what the actual saying is? It's sharp. Who said that? Of course Sean did. Yep. Um, <laughs> A card sharp, the Oxford English Dictionary, which I did read, you're welcome. Uh, A sharper is a cheat, a swindler, or a rogue. Okay, I like that word. A sharper was later reduced to a sharp. A card sharp is the mishear, or card shark is the mishearing of the earlier card sharp, which is if uh, people were playing cards and they were saying, this in Old English, this guy is cheating, they would yell, he's a card sharp. And and then we're like, no, he's a shark. And now we call people card sharks, right? Okay, none of you play cards. Fine. Um, Or you don't want to admit it. Now, what if I told you that someone got off what free? Scotch free? It's Scott. You guys are smarter. Why is it Scott? Does anyone know? I thought, like, they got free scotch. So clearly I'm mishearing it. They got off scot free because... In Scotland, there are taxes called Scott taxes, and to get off Scott free was to get off without paying your taxes. This meant a lot to me, having recently played a lot of taxes, right? <laughs> so we could get off Scott free. But our brains hear it one way, and then we repeat it over and over again. And sometimes we do that with church things, right? You ever had an argument with someone about something in the Bible? I recently was visiting someone who like assured me that the Bible said something and I'm like, pretty sure it doesn't. And um, then I thought, this is not worth the fight. This is what you think it is. And all right, I'm just going to let you have this one. But here are some ones. Again, Amy and I uh, had a meeting yesterday in San Diego and we drove and we looked up all of these misunderstood, but I've already given you the hint. So you're all going to be smarties about this, but just answer how you would have normally answered. Are you ready? What is the offending fruit of Eve? Apple. Thank you for playing along. Incorrect. Um, No. It's never mentioned it was an apple. One artist drew an apple, and now forever, Macintosh computers (laughs) will be a symbol of the fall. Right? When I was in seminary, I wore a t-shirt that had an apple on it with a bite out of it, and it said, my bad, Eve, right? (laughs) Okay, I still have it if you ever want to see it. Um, Okay, how many wise men were there? Incorrect. 
We say there were three wise men because there are three gifts, right? Could have been like 12 of them. They're like, hey, I'll, I'll go in on the frankincense. You know what I mean? Like they, <laughs> we don't know. Now, what animal swallowed Jonah? Dave gets the Sunday school award. It was not a whale. It just says a big fish. Either one, gross, don't think it actually happened that way, but we can talk about that later. But those are the things, right? When we are, um, how many animals? We will say two by two, right? It's a little vague in there. But we always have these stories that we tell. Now let's get a little bit deeper here. What is the root of all evil? You also get a, yes. We all, what do we often say? Money is the root of all evil, but as our Bible scholars over here pointed out, it's the love of money, and it's not the root of all evil, it's the root of all kinds of evil. Do you see those little slight differences? Is it the money that's evil? No. Money can do great things, right? As Danny shared with us earlier, money can have power in some okay things, but, but what is the root of all kinds of evil is the love of that, right? When we love that, when we value that. All right, what about this too shall pass? Is that in the Bible? You're all like, I don't know because you're gonna tell us. Um, <laughs> this too shall pass is actually not in the Bible, but you know what is? over 400 times, and it came to pass, right? This too shall pass. Now, this is one of my favorite ones, and if you know me really well, you know why. Cleanliness is next to godliness. (laughs) Is that in the Bible anywhere? No, but I found out something new. Amy helped me learn this. Do you know that John Wesley was the first person to say that? Ah, One of the only things I like about him. No, there's other things. (laughs) He was a really good guy. I'm just kidding. Okay. And perhaps relevant to this sermon and a little judgmental of a certain clothing line, here is something often misquoted. Are you ready? Be in the world, but not of the world. It is actually not in the Bible. What? What? but it's on t-shirts. The probable cause is it's the knitting together of John 15, 19, which is, if you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Do you hear the slight difference? It's not that you're not to be in the world, but you're not to belong to it. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then we also have this. This is from John 17. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Or perhaps it's from Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do you hear those slight differences? Do you hear how problematic it can be when we hear that we are not to be of this world? What does that say sometimes. Sometimes for folks that means when we talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which we'll talk about in a moment, people think as though that is something far away and that what happens here and now is of little importance because what happens later, that's the big show, right? And sometimes that can be helpful when we're going through tough stuff to think, well, it's all going to make sense later, but I think the problem is, is that we forget that this is sacred time. What we do here and now matters. And maybe, just maybe, as we'll learn from Jesus, the kingdom of God is already here amidst us, 
What do you mean? It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't look like it. But if we hear this call narrative that we just heard in Matthew, right? The kingdom of heaven has come near. So Jesus, when we talk about the different ways that he sort of shifts things, he'll say, you have heard it said, but I say. Now that's really interesting. You have heard it said. I think about how many of the things we have heard said in church, and yet sometimes we feel in our deep spirit that there is something more, or, or maybe it's not quite what we have heard. And so we come to this idea of the kingdom of heaven is near, and we hear repent. Let's look at this sentence a little bit, because I am a linguistic nerd. I love looking at words. I think that scripture is careful about the words that are in there. It says, repent. Now, we have taken repent to be a judgment thing, haven't we? Right? Um, You know, repent. What does that mean? We usually think it means for someone to ask for forgiveness, right? You need to repent. You need to be sorry. You need to feel it on a deep level. But repent in this way, in this word, if we look at this Greek version of repent, it really isn't about a feeling. Instead, it is about an action. What does repent mean? It means to turn around and go in the other direction which is helpful if someone's doing something that is really uh, harmful for you to say repent. You're simply saying, go in another direction. Turn around. See what you've done. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, kingdom of heaven is an interesting use of phrase. Many times in scripture, we've heard kingdom of God. But if we're looking at um, sort of the Judaic understanding that Jesus probably would have been coming out, to say God's name is almost blasphemy. Because you can't get God's name quite right, right? I am what I am. By the way, not Popeye, God, right? We are are told that, to like, who do you say is sending you? Say I am. Because the name is so big and so expansive, and it's us that sometimes brings it all down to this tiny little understanding of, like, I am. We say God. And so then we kind of try to use our brains to understand almost like when we're trying to understand this whole thing, we want to put a little box on it and say, this is what God is. Here's the God package. And then as many of us know, that package blows up and now you're left trying to build and add on and it's beautiful. So Jesus is speaking in this incredible way with, with authority, we're told. Yesterday we were talking at Passover about rabbis and rabbis, I, I share with you that I, I really love the sort of uh, Judaic understanding of like a rabbi is the one who has the authority to argue with scripture. We lose that. Sometimes people say things with so much authority that it's like either believe this. What is faith? Sometimes faith we boil down to like you just got to believe the right things, Right? The three steps, the four steps, the Roman road, here's what you, and you want to like have everybody else say the same things, and that's how you believe. And, and then Jesus comes in and says, oh, no, 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 you have heard it said, but I say. It would have felt really a little bit off-putting, but yet familiar when Jesus, uh, known as a Torah teacher, known as one who speaks with authority, known as Shmika, by the way, I, I learned that, and I probably just said it really wrong. Um, but this was uh, an idea, actually, Rob Bell talked about it. There's another guy, John Vander Lee, I think I'm saying his name wrong, who go into this sort of really, really interesting idea that Jesus is saying, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. I did not come to abolish Torah, but to fulfill it. Now, what did abolish Torah mean? Well, it used to be, if you got something wrong, like if a, if a rabbi asked you a question and you got the question wrong, they would say, you have abolished Torah, which simply means you got it a little wrong. Or if you were to get it right, they would say, you have fulfilled Torah. But we tend to think of abolish as like destroy. Some of the clobber verses we hear say, you are an abomination. But if we look at abomination in the original language, abomination actually means something out of the ordinary. See, we have taken these words and we think we know them so well, we've become over familiar with them to the point where we just sort of fill in the blank and we are not filled with awe. 
we hear this story of the call of the disciples. And we've talked about this a lot, right? This, this call narrative. So much so that we might miss out on sort of the oddity of this. See, in this story, we're told that Jesus walks by and invites them and they leave everything. And at first, those who are hearing the story for the first time in the Sermon on the Mount, as they're listening to Jesus speak, they're like, oh, I know this one. I've seen, you know, I've heard of this idea of people leaving all their things. If if people who are later experiencing, who are hearing the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, people who are actually hearing the disciples say, this is how I was called. They're like, oh, I know this one. It's the Elijah, Elisha story where God calls them and they leave everything, but they don't. See, the story is a little bit different Because Elisha, having been called, goes back, tells his family he has to go, and then takes off. And many call narratives in the Hellenistic understanding were like, as soon as your teacher called you, you left. But this one is different because they leave everything, even their families. So let's talk a little bit about the kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven is not a far off place. We know that even in this sentence, it's it's here, it's near. And it would have been familiar. Kingdom language would be familiar to them. Now it's not familiar to many of us, except if you watch Game of Thrones, right? By the way, Game of Thrones came up in our Passover meal. Like guys, that's how much it is. Like, and I can't watch it because it's too violent and scary and I don't have anyone to talk to while I watch it. But the show is sort of reminding us of kingdoms and all that kind of stuff. But for the people who are hearing the kingdom of heaven, they understand what a kingdom is. But this is not quite right. It's almost like the curse word in the middle of it. It's like it's familiar, but there's something a little different. And then in that moment, the over-familiarity breaks loose. And all of a sudden, they're seeing kingdom in a different way, empire. You can actually translate that word as the empire of heaven. Now, Star Wars fans, that's scary. The Empire. But it's taking something familiar, making it just a little different, and calling them in to something more. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, friends, part of this series of overfamiliarity is going to be that I am not going to be the only voice you're going to hear from. I know. I know, you're familiar with this voice. Some of you drown it out real well. And so we're going to actually hear from a couple other voices, one of which is Michael, who is right over there. And you may not know Michael, but he is actually a seminary professor who sits in here and listens to me. That's incredible, guys. Um, He and I were talking through, I really wanted to talk through this you have heard it said thing. I really wanted to talk about the Sermon on the Mount and how radical Jesus's like reinterpretations or reframing were. And he said, have you read Dallas Willard's Divine Conspiracy? And I said, no, can I? I'd love to see it. Guys, it's this big. Um, It's huge, but it's beautiful. And in it, he talks about this idea of over-familiarity. So Michael's actually going to share with us next week, which is going to be incredible. And then a week after that, guys, my friend, wait till I tell you his name, is coming to preach. Reverend Robert W. Lee, who is Robert E. Lee's great, great grandson, who is now huge in the Black Lives Matter movement. And he is, he's the guy that, uh, he's an incredible uh, preacher, but he's also someone who really believes in reframing history and understanding our past to move forward. So he's going to do a great job. It's Mother's Day, but he promises to do like a Mothering Sunday kind of deal. So hopefully it won't be too unfamiliar. So when we look at this idea, we see that the kingdom of heaven, as I've been reading these different books, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, what is that? I want to say it's all those moments, and we've, we've seen it, right? We feel it sometimes. The moments when they say the veil is thin, where you realize that God's desires are being lived out. You realize that this is the way of Jesus. This is the way of God. And you feel it. And, and it's not, I hate to say this as a church planter, this is the worst thing for me to say. It's usually not in church that we experience it. It's usually in these sacred, ordinary moments where all of a sudden it, 
There's something familiar, but it's more than that. There's something beautiful. You see it when all of a sudden these people that couldn't get along are getting along. When you feel the sense of the kingdom or the way of God's rule, it's filled with forgiveness. It's filled with grace. Each week we come so that we can recognize it, so we can see it. Because there are a lot of people that are telling us what the kingdom of heaven looks like and the six easy ways to get there, and the seven different steps to take. And so then we have to be reminded that it is present here and now. And yes, there might, might, and I would say is a hope for the future, but there's also a hope for now. And how can we be agents of this kingdom? How can we be members of this kingdom in the here and now? This is the place where God's will is possible. I love this idea. I love the idea that something so familiar can be revolutionary if we have the right eyes and ears. So we're gonna hear more ways that different things we've heard said, you have heard it said, but I say, and what a joy it is to be able to reframe things together, to pause, to do that, what a gift. Let us pray. God, we are grateful that you surprise us sometimes and that you come into the spaces and places that we are so familiar with, almost like we want to say, I know that one. And yet you say, no, 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 look at it again. See it differently. God, as we try to figure out what it means to be citizens of the kingdom of God, may we offer it to other people. May we have profound moments where our eyes are opened, our ears are opened to something new, something fresh. May we be a people who offer that to others. God, we are grateful for the people and teachers in our lives that show us the way. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.